on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Where do we plug lichen into the phylogenetic tree of life? Because they aren't like regular organisms, are they? This is where it gets really weird. The word symbiosis was actually created to, to, to describe lichen. It's at least 400 million years old. They create a city out of their body and then they let it be inhabited by photosynthetic organisms? Is that sort of what you're saying? Lichens are medicine as well. You'll see it deep fried with a a little yogurt dip or something. You can know every time you look at it, you've got nice clean air. People actually made clothing out of as well. Lichens will blow your mind. I have this really exciting feeling, and it sounds strange, but that I will die not knowing much about these guys, even though I've dedicated my life to studying them. Episode 32, Living in a Lichen Wonderland, with Felicity Roberts, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival was built on the premise of self-health care, the idea that ultimately you're responsible for your own health. Never before has that become more clear. While governments, health agencies, and medical professionals scramble to create policies and treatments for the masses, the wise amongst us are building the strongest, healthiest, and most adaptable versions of ourselves that we can. Sir Thrival specializes in time-tested immuno and adaptogenic formulas for modern humans. Check out Sir Thrival's elk antler formula for total body adaptation and anabolism. Colostrum and vitamin D3, K2 for incredible immune fortification. Reishi and chaga medicinal mushroom extracts for immunomodulation and physiological stress adaptation. Pine pollen for restoring androgenic balance in a xenoestrogen polluted world. And taboo for optimal hormone balance and sexual function. Sir Thrival, thriving no matter the circumstances. Go to SirThrival.com to check out the entire lineup. I just want to take a moment to say thank you for tuning into the podcast. If you like this show, I know you're going to love the Wild Fed TV show. You may have already checked out episode one on the River Floodplain, which is streaming for free right now at wild-fed.com. We created the coupon code Hunker Down for the COVID shutdowns, giving you 25% off the entire season. Now that things are thankfully opening back up, We're going to be taking down that coupon code in the next two weeks. If you've been on the fence about subscribing, now is the time. Again, the coupon code hunker down, which gets you 25% off the entire season, will only be active for the next two weeks. So if you want to see Wild Fed Season 1, now's the time to act. Go to wild-fed.com and use the coupon code hunker down for 25% off. And while you're there, you can support the show by picking up one of our Wild Fed trucker hats in field green or hunt or orange and by picking up one of our sticker packs too. Also, I write a newsletter every two weeks called The Subsistence, and we include content there that I don't post anywhere else. You'll get stories and photographs that are exclusive to the newsletter, find out about guest appearances I do on other podcasts, and see videos and outtakes from our show that you'll only get in The Subsistence. It's a beautifully laid out newsletter, and you're really missing out if you're not subscribed. Again, it comes out every two weeks, and you can get it over at wild-fed.com. So go there and sign up today. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Well, today's guest is Felicity Roberts, and this interview is about one of her many passions, the strange and category-defying world of lichen. As someone who spends a lot of time in the outdoors, I'm around lichen a lot, and I was aware that they were a composite organism, but that was about as far as I'd gone. This conversation was my first deep dive into lichenology, which, as you'll hear, blurs the neat and orderly lines we humans have become fond of drawing around species and kingdoms of life in our quest to categorize the world. Lichens draw us out of those simplistic phylogenies and into a world of wonder and fascination. There is so much to be learned from them, both biologically and, as Felicity points out in our conversation, metaphorically too. Your vision of biology will either get challenged or reinforced by these strange, multi-kingdom organisms. I promise you'll never see those crusts on rocks, rosettes on tree trunks, or filaments hanging from the trees in quite the same way again. 
it's definitely affected the way I see these ancient and unusual creatures, and it's subtly changing my basic presumptions about the landscape. And I'm really liking those changes. Felicity Roberts, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. So you are up in Newfoundland. Is that where you are from originally? Yes, um, I was born here. I spent a few years on Hornby Island in British Columbia, and then actually some time in the uh, U.S. of A. in Central Maine, Austin, Texas, and sort of tripping around like that. And now I've been home for almost ten years, living in St. John's. It's such an incredible place where you are. Of course, we know Lori, uh, and we've actually uh, we did an interview. We haven't released it yet, but we did do an interview with uh, Lori and Claire together. Um, I wish I got the chance to meet you when I came up to visit. Uh, but you've also, um, so in addition to there, you spent some time in Maine. Whereabouts? Um, my dad was recruited as an anesthetist in Dover Foxcroft. And then I also, in the jigs and the reels of coming home to visit for summers and working there and whatnot, I spent time in Bangor, time in Portland, and time in LaGrange. Oh, that's awesome. It's, I don't get to talk to a lot of people, uh, you know, who, who've spent time in Maine. You know, most people are not really familiar. So, you know, I know all those areas. So that's really cool to hear. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do and what you're into. It seems like kind of eclectic. I've spent some time, you know, watching some videos and reading some articles you've written and things like that. Uh, but if you ask me to sort of sum up what you do, I'm going to leave it to you. So, t- so kind of tell people a little bit of what you're into, what your interests are. And uh, in particular, how you got kind of fascinated by lichens. I guess I would largely describe myself as a renaissance woman. I do a lot of different things and I'm 44 years old now and really only in the past five to 10 years have any of these things started to cohese into any real thing. And I suppose at this point, I would say that I'm a writer, an educator, and I work in fine arts and crafts. But then those are all pretty large as well. Lichen is one of my main uh, main points of interest, and that came about just with a, a larger love affair with kingdom fungi, um, discovering that you could dye wool and different fabrics with mushrooms, loving that because then I could get into mushroom hunting without the fear of poisoning myself. If um, mm-hmm. I caught the mushroom wrong, I really, I just didn't get the color I wanted. So it was sort of a, a really fun way to explore that without some of the really high stakes. And um, I moved, that happened when I was in British Columbia, dear friend Susan sort of got me into all this stuff. Geographically, that part of the world, the Pacific Northwest, I mean, that's mushroom mecca, essentially, right? So you were in a place that was just, I mean, I imagine just about anything you want to find are are in the forest there. And larger, just every, in a lot of ways, strangely enough, Newfoundland and British, that part of British Columbia, Vancouver Island and the coast are very, very similar. It's just BC is huge. I always used to describe it as (laughs) Newfoundland on steroids, but it's, um, and it's sort of the same thing where you, the mushrooms you have that are the same, they're bigger in British Columbia. But what's more important, I think for me was that the season was longer and with the, the biodiversity and the length of the season, I could keep myself going for quite a while. And coming home, um, as you know, as you visited Newfoundland, we have a nice fall, but by November, you're done. There's been a hard frost. And there's, a, there's less biodiversity in a tundra and boreal forest climate anyhow. But I, mean, I think I, I've said this before in our preamble chat that that's if you're looking for sort of things you might find in California or in warm climate places, your large conspicuous biodiversity, the charismatic fauna and whatnot. But um, if you look around in our in our forest, you will find an incredible incredible diversity of life if you look at things like lichens. And I'm sure you're kind of aware lichens are not, a lot of people just don't even know what they are. You know, like I'll say to someone, I'll point out a tree that has some interesting lichens and say check out the lichens on that tree and it is not unusual for someone to look at me and say where are you seeing lichens okay don't reveal it what they are yet because i want to build up to that because i think it's so fascinating so okay. let me go back a second you were into kingdom fungi yeah. and that in itself is a very bizarre world i'm i'm constantly teasing this idea here on the show that the mushroom people are kind of the straight when you look at people who hunt fish forage and gather mushrooms it's like those mushroom people are the kind of the weirdest of all of those four types of person who gathers things from wild environments but i also have found and i'm and i'm curious how lichen fit into all this but i've also found that the mushroom people i I often generalize and paint with a really broad brush and say that they tend to be the higher iq folks of the four because 
you know, it's kind of hard to, you, I always joke, there's no poisonous look like deer, you know, when you start to get <laughs> into plants true? and things start to get a little bit more tricky and you have to, there's finer, you know, it's very easy to distinguish a deer, a moose, you know, even at distance, when you start to get into botany, it gets more precise, right? And you need to know more anatomically and botanically. And then when you get into the world of fungi, wow, it, t you know, you need brain computing power just to understand what you're dealing with and to stay alive very long, right? Where do, where do we plug lichen into the phylogenetic tree of life? Because they aren't like regular organ organisms, are they? They sort of, uh, they're a composite, no? This is where it gets really weird. The word symbiosis was actually created to, to, to describe lichen. Oh, wow. And as we are, we're learning more about lichen all the time. Like we've made major discoveries in the past 10 or 15 years. So if you look even at an older textbook, you'll get an incomplete definition. And we still don't know. Things are going to change more. But the basic idea we've got here is um, when you've got something like a mushroom, you have a fungi. Let's just take like two basic types, basidiomycete, which is like the classic mushroom shape that you see, and ascomycete, which would be like a sac fungus. The probably an ascomycete that anyone might recognize would be a morel. But um, these are, you know, these are pure fungi. That's what they are. They, um, they don't photosynthesize. They, you know, they need to eat, so to speak. Um, and they generally decompose dead things. Although you know, even with mushrooms, there's a lot going on. But they're, they're pretty simple compared to lichen in that with lichen, you've got your fungal partner. Or Okay, we'll start with the old definition that anyone over 20 got in school. You have a fungal partner and you have what's called a photobiont, a part that photosynthesizes that mm. will be either algae or cyanobacteria. And so people use any description from fungi that have learned to farm, fungi that have gone solar, because the, um, the fungal partner basically provides the housing and protection and sort of a, a sunscreen to let the light, right amount of light in, but not too much. And the photobiont photosynthesizes and produces food for the fungi. So you've wow. got sort of an extremophile that can live in, I mean, it's, it's a pretty large part of the Arctic biomass. Also deserts, play, you know, places, extreme places where very few things can live. So lichen is definitely like it's an ancient, ancient thing. It's at least 400 million years old. Could be more. There's discoveries being made all the time, but I'm giving you a, a conservative estimate. 400, 400 million? million? Oh, yes. Wow. So this, because what you're describing to me, if we were talking about now, I'm being warned all the time by scientists not to anthropomorphize, um, but I just disagree. I like to, so I'm going to. Um, <laughs> I feel like uh, if this was human beings and we were able to create the correct environment for another organism, which we were going to then utilize to produce food, which we do that. And when we started doing that, we call it a revolution. We call it the Neolithic Revolution call it the beginning of agriculture and we consider it a technology so in a sense if we were going to anthropomorphize we have a fungi who's figured out the technology to farm um these cyanobacteria or algae in order to produce sugars through photosynthesis so they're they're like building a they create a city out of their body and then they let it be inhabited by photosynthetic organisms is that sort of what you're saying that's basically the story. Another wow. ex another way that people describe lichen is rather even than a type of organi organism, it's described as a fungal lifestyle. <laughs> I'm serious. And then wow. other other people will give you know describe lichens as small ecosystems. And okay. through um some really amazing field work I got to do a couple of summers ago, I learned that many lichens actually like well I. Th I'm not, I don't want to say all, possibly all, but at least many have their own specific parasites. So this, you know, the, the, the lichen becomes a world, a cosmos onto itself. Hence, many people call them ecos, tiny ecosystems. Wow. Okay. So <clears throat> like I was saying before, I kind of would almost consider it like a technology then. And, and then it's 400 million years old is really pretty incredible to think about. So when you were saying you had come back from BC... Uh, home to Newfoundland and uh, kind of were able to find biodiversity, were able to replace that feeling of biodiversity you had out in the West Coast by, I guess, zooming in a little bit on 
the the lichens that were there because there are stretches. You know, Lori brought me to the bat. I, you call it the Badlands? What did she call that area? No, the not the Badlands. Barrens. The Barrens, right? Barrens. So yeah. Lori, Lori took me to the Barrens where. You know, if you took somebody from the city and you just pulled up and let them out of the car and they looked around, they'd be like, not much here. And then you get down on your hands and knees, you start looking around. And like you said, it's a, it's richly um, diverse at the ground level. So was that sort of like where, how you tapped into that diversity? Um, I will say, say that to speak to that, lichens are sort of a philo- philosophical revolution in seeing the small things. If you're yeah. familiar with the William Blake poem, to see the world in a grain of sand, eternity uh-huh. in an hour, like that's the kind of feel you get from lichens. You're moving into this tiny microcosm right. that, expla- that explains very much the macrocosm. Their lichens will blow your mind for sure. But I do actually agree with that, with what you said that, you know, it's, there's, there's something that draws you in, in the sense that when you do first go to the Barrens, well, the name describes it. Yeah. The trees might come up to my knees. Friends of mine in British Columbia die at that. They're like, are those trees or bushes? (laughs) Yeah, they're trees. But when you really look, you find these incredible worlds of color and texture and, I suppose just because I've gotten into the science and chemistry of lichens, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And I, I have this really exciting feeling, and it sounds strange, but that I will die not knowing much about these guys, even wow. though I've dedicated my life to studying them. Wow, that's a, that's a cool way to look at it. Yeah, I'm curious about these lichenologists who come to Newfoundland because – and forgive me if this is just, you know, maybe I'm just being too rigid in, in how I'm thinking about it. I have a feeling a lot of this interview today is going to be about breaking down some of that rigidity and how I want to organize things structurally in my mind. But, I, you know, I like the idea that this person studies kingdom fungi, this person studies plants, this person studies animals, this person studies uh, protists or whatever. Um, who who are lichenologists? Do do they come from one of those fields or is it its own field? Because if these are composite organisms that are made partly of fungi and then also, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe at least at present, we categorize both cyanobacteria and algae in the protist family. So they're not even plants, but something other than plants. So that that puts lichen in this very weird not only do they defy categories, but they're made up of weird categories. So who are lichenologists and where do they come from? Lichenologists, I think in many ways, are people quite like myself, whether they come from a traditional educational background, which I don't, or it's funny, I have access to a university lab to work in now, but I've never like been a university science student. I studied right, philosophy okay. and Eastern religions for a bit, but it's, and it's, that's actually a fairly common story. There's a lichenologist at University of Berkeley who was a construction worker who got really interested in some lichens on one desert site he was in. And by this point now, as I said, is a professor and has named three different species. And firstly, because there's no money in this, like this is not one of the elements of science that gets big funding. So it's people who are coming out of intellectual curiosity and desire there's a million discoveries to be made for the same reason, because like most people are not going to know your name if you name a lichen, but you're, you're in a field if you're studying this where you're going to get that chance if you try hard enough. You're, I've, I've okay. discovered things, and that's, oh, wow. that's okay. a really amazing feeling. Okay. In other words, like um, a lot of these species haven't been named to science is what you're saying. New new lichen species have been discovered in, in Newfoundland in the time that I've been studying them, even if it's wow. just, say, we thought there were two Oclerichias, but there's a third or whatnot. <laughs> so that's really exciting. Right. I guess, actually, to go back to speak also to who are lichenologists in the traditional education field, and they exist there too, people who have actually gone to normal university and gotten into lichen there. It just tends to be people in biology, in the life sciences who just discovered lichen along the way and kind of had the same feeling I did of like, wow, this is really cool. I'd like to learn more about this. 
but they don't come from i guess more specifically what i what i mean is like they don't have a are they mycologists and they migrate over are they studying protests or are they is it it doesn't come through one of those standard pathways you know what i'm saying like um like if you studied you know fungi i would say oh yeah you're a mycologist but lichenologists People, like they're, they're wh wh okay maybe let me ask this way how where do we classify them where do they fit what kingdom are they supposed to be in or are they well they technically i mean i i don't even know i suppose you you would just say fun you know they contain parts of kingdom fungi and <laughs> right. you know so that's a, that's a really tough one there i mean that's a, we can talk about that later more because that's actually the basis of a large fine arts project I have with some scientists and artists is like okay. the amazing challenge and joy that lichens present in that they, they upset all our ideas of categories. But in terms of the sciences people come from, um, there's a landscape ecologist who I work with and she would say very clearly, she's not a lichenologist, but I'm actually going to say that she specializes enough in lichen that while she may not, she may technically still use the term landscape ecologist, I consider her a lichenologist. Uh, okay. And um, Troy McMullen is our, you know, our rock star lichenologist in Canada now. And I actually don't know what Troy's background is, but I'm assuming some sort of general biology was what led him there because at one point he was talking about how he had chosen to narrow down to just lichen and he made some kind of joke about botany and like you know angiosperms and gym gymnosperms that's it you're done and yeah. lichen gets way more sort of complex than that i'm actually just realizing i maybe shouldn't have said that <laughs> troy said that <laughs> because he's a bit, bit making me dis and botanist yeah but he's gonna be getting the hate that, mail <laughs> but i uh, mean yeah, that whole idea that um i mean i also remember it though because it was funny and i never thought about it that way but yeah you know there's within many classifications of life it, it is a lot easier to classify it reproduces like this or it reproduces like that it fits neatly here and there'll always be a few outliers but largely things fit neatly but lichen does take you to a place where nothing fits neatly i i sort of lost where i was going with the last question well, and then i started well, yeah i get i guess though i'm asking like is it we we name them with the same binomial you know nomenclature we still give them like a scientific name a genus and a specific epithet and then they are but where are they cl i guess yeah that's what i'm trying to figure out are they classed as plants are they classed as fungi are they classed as algae do they just kind of hang out on the phylogenetic tree of life on their own branch well, Who Daniel, are? it's interesting that you ask that. There's actually a hashtag for this, hashtag justice for lichens. I don't know if this has been changed yet because I haven't followed up on it, but sometime <laughs> a while back, there is sort of, I got a letter of, you know, from concerned people of the type that I would know that the Google definition for lichen called them plants. So oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I signed the petition that, you know, I don't know whatever happened with that. I just, as I said, I had received a piece of email, so I signed the petition. But that's the, that's kind of where we're at with lichen and basically like the general knowledge of them. I um, They were originally classified by Linnaeus as lesser plants. Okay. And that's largely oh, nice. how they've up until the 90s really been dealt with is these sort of little weird rag bag, unimportant, you know, organisms that hang off trees or whatever. I don't think anyone thought much about classifying them more than that because I don't think anyone cared that much or paid that much attention to them. So that's one of the real challenges now in studying lichen is just kind of explaining what they are. And then, you know, when you get questions like yours saying, we're figuring that out. Um, that's changing <laughs> every day. And that's kind of where I said I, I had left, sort of lost my train with the last question. But what I really did need to follow up with is I had given you the definition of lichen before another major discovery was made, which is that there is often a third partner. So oh. it would be a third fungal partner. In the first case that it was discovered, it was a yeast. It was um, a Briaria lichen which is used as food or can be used as food and what's known as a, a lotharia, which is what is known as wolf like. And because you like in uh, colonial days, uh, homesteaders would, uh, would poison wolves that were raiding their cattle. 
by mixing this lichen up with some meat. So it's quite oh, toxic. Nice. There's only two or three lichens that can kill you, which is a great thing about lichen. Now there's acids in them that if not leached out can make you quite unwell. But in terms of toxic lethality, very, very few lichens have it. And generally you can t- kind of tell by the chartreuse color that they have that they are toxic lichens. But <laughs> someone had sort of realized that Bryoria and Lotharia were um they should be the same lichen but somehow they were very very different lichens so okay. with tests that were done they discovered that there was a third light its third partner i believe it was in the litharia that um it was yeast and that that set off studies then looking for third partners in other lichens and they've been found now all over the globe so i don't think in any way we can say that all lichens are polyamorous per se, but some are. <laughs> okay. And then I would love to just ask a bunch of uh, kind of like quick rapid fire questions because I don't understand the landscape I'm in right now. And I'm sure the listener recognizes that I'm in over my head a bit here. So uh, first question I want to ask, are lichens cosmopolitan or are they restricted to any particular kind of um, range or distribution? Well, because they're extremophiles, you will like the lichen as a general life form you will find everywhere. But obviously certain lichens prefer different climates, even microclimates. Like there are certain lichens that only grow on certain levels of a tree. So they're very, very specific in what they like. At the same time, they're, they're deeply cosmopolitan in that there's really nowhere that there's not lichens. They tend okay. to prefer to stay out of the city because most are really, really sensitive to air pollution. But then there are lichens like Xanthoria that totally challenge that and like suck up the heavy metals and still thrive. <laughs> okay. Um, this is something I've noticed. I'm sure you've seen this too. Someone will be familiar with a plant and then but they don't have any botanical background then they'll try to describe that plant to you and then you'll watch this thing happen to them and you watch this look on their faces they realize that they can see it in their mind but they don't know how to speak it out because they don't have any uh ability to name plant parts and describe them so then they start saying things like it's got a green thing and then there's like a yellow kind of round part and you're like yeah it's not really helping um with lichen, I feel like I would do that. Are there any, is there any language around this that would make it easier for me or the listener to talk about lichens? When I see them, you know, sometimes they look um, crust-like, sometimes they they are flaky, sometimes they look leathery. You know, I, I don't really know any words to talk about lichens. Is there anything that makes this conversation simpler for the layperson? There is nothing simple about lichens, <laughs> but I can get into some different ways that you can describe lichens. The only problem here, and I'm going to put it quite bluntly, is that a lot of these categories fade into each other. Mm-hmm. So it can, certain lichens may have elements of a crustose lichen, but maybe higher raised off a rock. And they, so we'll start with basically um, your, your, your major lichen groupings. A crustose lichen is those lichens that, well, they're like little crusts. You see them on rocks. They don't really have a body that's raised off the rock. They're mm-hmm. just like a film. So that's your, and they're, um, when you hear about lichens being slow growing and long lived, they're the poster children. These guys can, some of them will grow as little as like part of a millimeter a year, but they can live for like 10,000 years. So wow. they're, that's one of their superpowers for sure. But when you're looking at one like that, is there any way to say that it is a distinct organism? Uh, in the, you know, if I look at six deer in a field, I know I'm looking at six individual deer. Do you know what I'm saying? But when I yep. look at a, a mushroom fruit body, let's say a patch of fruit bodies, they may all be fruit bodies coming from one mycelial mass beneath the ground. Uh, so in other words, they're all the same organism. When I'm yep. looking at something like that, am I seeing lots of individuals or one individual or is that difficult to really distinguish? That's difficult to really distinguish. <laughs> With crustose, crustose lichens as well, they are really the most difficult to key out. And when I see, say key out, I mean figure out the exact species that we're dealing with. And that's how I wound up actually starting to work in a lab, was having a couple of crustose lichens I needed to key out. And a friend of mine who worked in the lab basically saying, you're going to need chemicals and a microscope for that. So... Wow. Can you describe for the listener what, what key out means? Uh, I think it, with, with botany, it's fairly straightforward, but just for somebody who might not know what you mean. 
It just means I'm um, say I've got a lichen and I want to know what it is. So I'll look at um basically Erwin Brodo, Sylvia Duran Sharanoff, and Stur- Stephen Sharanoff, who wrote Lichens of North America. There is a key that comes with that and an expanded key that came out recently. But I would um, go into the lab. I would actually take those books. I would take the you know the lichen that I have, and the first thing I would start doing was is dropping chemicals on it. There's several different chemicals that you have, anything from bleach, and they're all they're all pretty safe except for a couple. But you'll like <laughs> you might get a, a, a lichen will cha- a turn red when you drop bleach on it, and say okay. like I want to know if something is an umbilicaria, and it turns red. We call that a C test. If I if it turns red then um, I've got umbilicaria. Now, for anyone who knows lichen, that's poor choice because it's really easy to tell an umbilicaria. But when you get down to certain crustose lichens, the most legendary crustose lichen I have now, I've been working on for a year and I've got it keyed down to one of possibly five species. But in order to find out (laughs) anything further, I would have to send it to another lab on the mainland of Canada for something called thin layer chromatography. TLC in normal people's life may be tender, loving care, but for lichenologists, it's thin layer chromatography. And that would, <laughs> you know, that would let me know what the lichen is. So okay, that's so keying out. It's like that choose your own adventure thing. Like, is it red or green? Okay, it's red. All right. So if it's red, is it tall or short? And then you kind of follow those key, those down to yeah, does it have TV. a large ap- black apothecia or no apothecia? Is there ceridia? These, these are all like reproductive features. But reproductive features are a big one in that one. They are all around the world. They're difficult to to describe, though. They they don't have simple like, oh, there's a leaf blade with a petiole and an entire margin or a serrate margin or something like that in botany. So it's a little bit more difficult. What do they have? Like general categories? You were talking about the. Are you saying crustos when you're referring crustose? to crustos? Yeah, those are your your crusty rock ones. Okay. And then there's pow- powdery lichens, which look like powder. You'll often see those on trees or just right on the soil. And then they're okay. they're great because they actually help sto- soil stability and keeping the soil in place. Right. But um, then you go into um, the a fruticose lichen, which is sort of um, like your classic usnea, you know, beard lichens. Those things are fruticose lichens, you know, hanging arboreal lichens. I tend to like more um, more specific terms. Like many people might say, you know, that usnea, that's fruticose lichen. But I try to I call it an arboreal hair lichen oh, because okay. that really keys it down more and lets you know that I'm not talking about a certain bushy sort of lichen or different right. lichen forms that could be in that category. For the I'm listener, specific- though, who doesn't, who, who isn't used this kind of language, arboreal, meaning it's in the trees. Hanging on a tree, yeah. Right. And you said arbo- arboreal hair, is that what you said? Yep. Yeah, this is like Briaria, which is known as the horsehair lichen, Methuselah. Okay. You know, was shaggy hairy lichen. in a tree. <laughs> hair like lichens that hang out of trees. Got it. And those, okay. Yeah, those specifically are great to talk about because for the general public, that is a lichen. Like if you're okay. gonna get that connect, that's the thing. Like, oh, those things hanging out of the tree that we used to like put under our armpits at Girl Guide Camp, <laughs> pretend we had hairy armpits or whatever. And that, but right. then, and also a lot of bushmen use them as fire starter. But oh, it's yeah, either okay. way, it's it's a way to get people to make a connection. I'm not actually not advocating using lichen as fire starter, but I'm just saying there's a lot of different ways that people are familiar with those, and then right. they get the, oh, there are lichens everywhere. They are all right. around me. What about when they form, I want to say like a rosette or a float, like a, almost like they're growing like, um, like a floret would come out of the ground in the early for like a biennial plant that's coming up. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? I'll see them like on a tree where it forms, it's circular and almost looks like, yeah, the early stages of a cabbage coming up or something like that. I think that for what I'm sort of picturing you're talking about is right. Then we, those would be generally referred to as shield lichens. Ah, okay, yeah, sure. These are all really general terms in that what I might use is different than another person who studies lichen might use. So you it's you need to be really really clear about your terms here again mm-hmm. because lichens are so poorly defined. We you know, we're still trying to fix the, the Google definition. 
I right. need to be really careful if I refer to a beard lichen that I let people know that I'm talking about usneas and not, say, an electoria or a brioria, that they might, if they don't know a lot about lichen, all lump together as beard lichens. You have to spend so much time with lichens talking about what you're not talking about before uh-huh. you can actually get down to to what you are. There's a lot of confusion. Um, I made a short film one year called They Call It Old Man's Beard. Five minute doc <laughs> for a five minute doc challenge. It's on YouTube. If you want to hear my rant about the lichens that yeah. generally comprise, comprise what we call old man's beard, at least in my region, what they really are and then what each is good for, that's out there on YouTube. And it All is right, like we're, my We're going to put rant. a, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. What about a uh, common name rock tripe here, um, which we see on glacial erratics or rock faces, you know, exposed cliffs and things like that. Black, black frilly stuff turns like yeah. almost an olive green when it's wet. It feels leathery to the touch yet. Yeah. yeah, that's umbilicaria. Um, that's okay. uh, the one I had mentioned that will turn uh, sort of a magenta red if you drop bleach on it. Oh, that's oh okay. F- Famous, famous dye lichen. That's one of my babies. Um, It does an amazing, amazing thing where when you put it in, you you call it fermenting, but it's not really fermenting per se. It's just a chemical reaction that happens. But if I put umbilicaria in a jar with a solution of half household ammonia and half water, or if you want to do it old school, the way it was traditionally done, you just use your own pee and the ammonia in that will will work. You got to age the urine? Yeah, well, the... um, Technically, you should, but it'll Get work if urea. you don't. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it'll just take a bit longer. I When I first started playing with this, before I sort of wanted to actually splash and uh, splash out and buy real commercial ammonia, <laughs> I just did some, you know, the uh, call it the YOU method, your own u- urine, just to, you know, and then it yeah. worked and something turned purple. And so I went on and got standardized commercial ammonia. With that, you just have a lot more control over the reaction. But you sort of get to see that happen over the period of it's longer with your own urine. Urine can be many weeks. It's just a couple of weeks with commercial ammonia. But you see it turn into this brilliant, bright magenta that is just not a color you associate with natural dyes. That's the color you can fix is that yep. magenta? Wow. Yep. And then what about these ones that um, they – grow on the the ground itself forming like a crusty mat i know Lori likes to fry up uh one she calls i believe she calls it caribou moss um but these ones that i feel okay these are the ones i feel terrible about stepping on when i'm in the mountains i mean i just you feel them like go from something that looks like coral to total powder under your feet right yeah, you, I try not to step on them too, def- definitely, although we have a lot of them here. So it's like a little less worry on our tundra, but they, I guess, are would be fruticose. I, don't, I can't actually guarantee that, but I'm just thinking of their shape. That's some um, what I would classify them as. They, I think, have a, a lifespan of about 100 years. They yeah. are um, e- eaten heavily by caribou, and um, it's um, – in the indigenous uh, food around here traditionally would be if you hunted a caribou, one of the things that was really delicious apparently was when you cut open the stomach, you would take the the warm half digested lichen out of there and eat it. And that was <laughs> supposed to be amazing. So, I was talking to a guy about it the other day. He said it was not amazing when he had it, but, um, but that he <laughs> ate it nonetheless. <laughs> Well, that would be a different thing, though, pre-digested by a caribou. So no, that's what I'm that, saying. He had it. He, oh, he had, oh, hunt, he had, it he like had hunted. Oh, yeah, wow. he had hunted. Uh, yeah, up oh, that north. That guy's my hero. Uh, yeah, well, he, it was offered to him, and he he didn't want to turn it down. So, um, but yeah, he was like, they seemed to like it more than he did. Um, I can you now that we're talking about that. I'm I'm wondering when we look back. Um, I guess ethnobotanically wouldn't be the correct term, but what are the what are some of the traditional uses that um, come to mind for you when you're thinking about lichen, particularly, let's say, with the world's indigenous folks who, you know, pre-industrially um, were utilizing more things for their landscape? Are they foods? Are they medicine? Are they poisons? Are they dyes? Like, or are they all of those kind of things? What were people all doing of the with above. lichens? Yeah, tell us a little bit about it. That's actually the term there is ethnolichenology, and oh, that's actually that. kind of one. I guess I forgot when you asked me what I did because that's another kind of great kind of catchphrase for the number the, the numbers of things that I do that I sort of fold under the lichen 
the lichen umbrella, if you will. But that's no lichenology, obviously, just meaning people's use of lichens over the years. Dyes definitely is a huge one. And um, the actually the first indig- recorded indigenous lichen dye was um, one of the people involved in the Hudson's Bay um, Company was keeping journals in Labrador. And there was a, something called Mossy was the indigenous name. And it was a bright yellow um, dye that they would dye pork porcupine quills and whatnot with. That's actually one of my pet projects right now is trying to figure out what lichen mossy was because it's um, yeah. they theorize that they, it's a litheria, but to the best of my knowledge, and again, our knowledge is incomplete, so it might just be that no one knows about it yet, but to the best of my knowledge, there's no litheria here. So I've become really interested in trying to figure out Track what some down. of these historical dye stuffs were. But that's, um, dyes are a huge one. The original Harris tweeds were all lichen dyed because that was a time when um, people were using ammonia fermentation. Some highfalutin British writer once said that when you walked into British Parliament, for as fine as it looked, the air was heavy with the stench of urine because of <laughs> all, all the Harris tweed coats. Wow. Lichen, our wow. medicine as well. We're actually um, doing some really great work looking for new antibiotics in lichens. And there are, like, topically, in terms of tap- topics, Topical antibiotics, more so in Europe than in here, than here. But you actually, there are topical antibiotics that contain various lichens. Lichens have such an amazing number of chemicals that are unique to them that are, we are just beginning to study. I hear a lot about usnea as a treatment for antibiotic resistant Staphylococcus. Is that ac- is that something that people use it for? Hey, we'll get right back to the show in a moment, but first. Despite the fact that I stay really up to date on advancements in gear and equipment, when it comes to gathering plants, mushrooms, and yes, lichens too, I really like to use a wooden basket. And it's not just nostalgia about bygone days, it's because even in the 2020s, it's still the optimal tool for the job. Baskets are semi-rigid, so they protect delicate leaves, buds, flowers, fruits, and fungi, but they also have flex, making them very comfortable to carry and live around compared to a bucket or plastic bin. Now you could try using a backpack, but unless it's got a rigid container inside of it, it tends to crush any delicate plant or fungal material you gather. And unlike a pack, bucket, or bin, baskets breathe, allowing air in and heat and moisture out. Most pack baskets are extremely expensive and making them yourself while very rewarding is a specialty skill most of us don't have. If you're looking for a beautiful, functional custom pack basket, check out my buddy Corey Slater on Instagram. His handle is at ADK Baskets. That's ADK Baskets. He makes your pack to order, so you'll have lots of color and design options, and each one is a work of art. In fact, I store mine decoratively when they're not being used. Tell him we sent you or use the coupon code WILDFED, and he'll give you 20 bucks off your order. Now, he turns these orders around really fast, too, so you'll be forging with your pack basket within a couple weeks. Better still, he ships free in the continental U.S. I had Corey make me four matching baskets, two pack baskets, one large one and one small one, as well as a blicky. That's a basket that hangs off your belt in front so you can drop fruits or leaves while you're harvesting directly into it, rather than holding it, freeing up both of your hands to gather. I also had him make me a creel, which is a small basket you wear over your shoulder that has a slot in the lid to drop trout or other small fish into while you're out catching them. All four are a matched set that's ultra-functional, but also very, very beautiful. Again, it's ADK Baskets on Instagram. That's Alpha Delta Kilo Baskets, ADK Baskets. Tell Corey I sent you and he'll give you 20 bucks off your order. Now, back to the show. I can't say anything that specific. I definitely know that Usnea is one of the promising lichens in terms of antibiotic yeah. research, but staff specifically, I'm not, and that's not to say it's not true. I'm just not familiar with that research, but I would it, certainly not be surprised. So there's modern medical applications and we see that um, ethnographically too, reports of it being used medicinally, topically, internally, anything like that? Totally. Um, all sorts of wacky ones. Like um, in Andalusia, I guess at one point, Xanthoria, which is also a dye lichen that I use, but I gather that it, if you put it in red wine, 
it's great for menstrual cramps. I have a oh, feeling wow. that's the excuse <laughs> to drink the red wine and probably right. need another one with more xanthoria because yeah. that one didn't exactly. work. May Turns have a lot it, to do work, with it. Works great without the lichen too. <laughs> yeah. But, so all sorts of like neat little, you know, folk remedies like that. I mentioned the antibiotic one simply because in terms of actual solid scientific research, that is something that it is beyond a folk remedy, be, you know, showing mm-hmm. promise in peer-reviewed reports repeatable studies. And uh, which is not to say that folk remedies may not have their own serious validity too, but because of, you know, I'm trying to work now within a university framework as well. It is really important for me that my, anything I say be accurate and provable. Yeah. But I I see that you're an herbalist too, so we can read between the lines here. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm an herbalist who is the child of a doctor and I'm actually, I'm a a fairly scientifically solid herbalist. Like I really really believe in the power of phytochemicals. I mean, that's where our medicines come from. Aspirin comes from white willow. Like most of our antibiotics come from the soil. It's one of the things people forget when they try to separate quote unquote natural medicine and allopathic or traditional, you know, what we call traditional medicine, although it's very far from traditional, is that they're all actually playing with the same chemicals. It's just not the actually an excellent comparison would be if I'm making lichen dye with my own pee, that's um, that's like sort of traditional herbalism. But if I then figure out what chemicals are working, like the ammonia and the pee, standardize the mix, it's still the same dye basically, but now I have much more control over what exactly what shade I'm going to get, how long this is going to take. And I think that's very much the same as taking sort of, you know, phytochemicals and standardizing them as quote unquote medicine. That's a really good analogy. I I sometimes get frustrated by the fact, uh, because I feel like similar to you, I really appreciate the science and I appreciate the, you know, the folk remedies too. Um, And it's frustrating that sometimes in allopathy, they won't acknowledge that the phytochemical is identical or very similar to the um, substance they're working with. So I wouldn't mind if they said, hey, it's just that it's weaker and uh, we can't standardize it. But it is, I'd be like, okay, cool. At least you're acknowledging it. But when they act like it has, there's like, you know, no validity at all. And it's like, come on, guys, you, you. You started with this plant. That's how you got this drug. Uh, but anyway, that's a side tangent. So no, um, I, I totally relate to that. That's totally frustrating. And it actually hits on a, a project I'm doing right now. I think that I spoke of with both scientists and artists. And it's like using lichen as our, our I guess, our the angle or the lens that we're coming at it through. But we're talking about arts and sciences as very different ways of knowing that not just complement each other, but ultimately when they work together, become more than the sum of their parts and give mm-hmm. us a greater understanding of everything. Are, were they ever directly foods themselves? I know you were sort of saying eating the pre-digested form of lichens from the digestive tract of, of ruminants, things like that, but were they ever used um, as either a primary food or even maybe as a survival food? Survival food is a big one. Um, Rock tripe actually is, that can be a survival food. And I have heard um, from various sort of bushcraft survivalists that rock tripe is one of the lichens that I mentioned earlier, there's an acid in lichens that makes digesting them quite uncomfortable. So I think the, the line is, you won't die, but you might feel like you wish you did. So, oh, wow. so there's different ways to leach those acids out through boiling or just through you know changing standing water for a few days. But rock tripe, I gather, is one of the lichens that has the least of that acid. And now, I, I, you cannot quote me on this in the sense that I have not tried it. I'm not, other than when, li- when Lori cooks her or Icelandic moss bread. And of course, Icelandic moss, like caribou moss, both are actually lichens. But um, I will eat lichen sort of in those senses. But I, it's not what you would consider a tasty food, but it is a survival food. Um, because Cladonia range of farina, caribou moss, which you were talking about with Lori, that's now the, I, I don't know if it's just um, in the, in the uh, works of becoming Canada's national lichen, or it is already Canada's national <laughs> lichen. But back to Troy McMullen, our, our 
our sort of our rock star like enologist at the Museum of Nature in Ottawa. Um, he, I don't know who, I'm sure other people were involved, but I got, there was an email sent from him that was just, you know, here are eight lichens, vote for a lichen, we're picking Canada's <laughs> national lichen. And um, Cladonia rangifarina was the winner. So I don't know if it still has more, another, more to go through to be crowned the national right. lichen or if it just is now. But that's, that's our lichen, that's our guy. We chose that one. That's become a popular food in terms of um, locavore, lo- locavore eating. You'll see it deep fried with a, a little yogurt dip or something. But again, it's more of an accent food than yeah, like a garnish bulk food. Right. Although it may maybe a little bit more than a garnish. It's got some crunch and you can dip it, but it's not it's not going to be your main, so to speak. So this is kind of how you eat lichen. Um, Bryoria, I gather, on the west coast of North America, used to be boiled down and made into a sort of a cliff bar. And wow. that would be that would be like one of the more eaten lichens. And Bryoria people actually made clothing out of as well. If you look at um, the book I mentioned, Lichens of North America, um, there's some amazing photos of Does Bryoria it have a clothing. common name? Horsehair lichen. But again, the people use so people right. u- use lichen names interchangeably. Yeah. So this is a place where even if you don't use any other Latin names anywhere else, and it kind of is good to anywhere, but here you need to because a lot yeah. of lichens just have no common name, and even those that do, they are used interchangeably with different lichens. So if I you know, I rather than saying to you the brown part of old man's beard, I'll say Briaria Fremonti. And then yeah. we know very specifically what I'm talking about. Yeah, I wish, you know, this this is like one of these things that I talk about that kind of bothers some people, but I'm just fascinated by IQ and wild foods. And so it, it would be so interesting to me if we could get a baseline sort of average IQ for people who are into lichens. Cause it's sort of like with, with mushrooms, you've got a handful of mushrooms that are common enough that we do use common names. But when you're around mushroom people, as I'm sure, you know, you get into a subset where almost everything is in Latin because it becomes too specific. And there's, it's just, there aren't even common names for a lot of these mushrooms. But now talking about lichens, well, I feel like it's even, we're in even weirder territory here and it requires a kind of brain that, um, wow, even a little bit more sophisticated of a thing to talk about. It's so complex. Um, I will, I keep wanting to dumb it down and you keep kind of saying to me like, Hey dude, you can't, <laughs> you, just, you can't, but that, that one that Lori deep fries, does that range down here into new England or, um, is it, um, am, am I South of its range? I think it would. I actually, I ha I, I don't know. I can't yeah, tell you that. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Take a look. I've been wondering I, 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 about I, it, but, but again, you called its scientific name is what? Cladonia rangifarina. Now, Cladonia okay, is like a really large group. There's thousands of Cladonias. And you know those little pixie cups you see? Like the tiny little lichens that stick up. They're like a little tiny wine glass. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I That's do. a Cladonia oh, okay. as well. Okay. And Very the, different morphology. Yeah, you. It's not you know certain lichens you can go. That's a xanthoria because it's bright orange or whatever. <laughs> right, but right, Cladonias right, right. are really all over the map. Um, I want to just say for people listening, just to sort of anchor this to something is in season two of the Wild Fed show, we sit down with Lori and she cooks this lichen, uh, as you just mentioned, she deep fries it. And what it does is adds like a nice little crunch component to the meal. Again, it's it's certainly not the um, caloric superstar of the, the dish. It's just there to add sort of some accent. Uh, but I've been wondering about lichens that look very similar down here. And, and that leads me to this next question. You, you've been saying that a lot of them contain acids that, um, are hard on the digestive system, but, uh, talk to me about those ones that are toxic. You mentioned one that was used to kill wolves. Um, but you said there's really only a few that are, uh, lethally toxic. Lutheria vulpina, that's wolf lichen. Um, sunshine lichen, which I believe is vulpina panastri. I could, I could have that one totally wrong. I know panastri is in there, but there's um, those are there are two lichens that are toxic, and they are both a chartreuse color. I can't guarantee that there are not any more, but if there are, there are very few more. Okay. Yeah, like it's it's a tiny 
tiny number of lichens that will actually kill you. And then yeah, Letharia and Sunshine Lichen are the two that I am familiar with. Sunshine Lichen does grow here and Letharia doesn't, which is, as I said, why I've become really curious as to what Mossy was, because I don't get the feeling that it could have been Letharia. In another question I have, when I one thing I've wondered actually for years, so I see lichens growing on the ground, I see them growing on trees, I see them growing on rocks. I never think about it when it's on the ground, but when I see them on trees, I definitely wonder if they're symbiotic or if they are parasitic. So that's one question. And then similarly, when I see them on rocks, I wonder if over time they are eating those rocks. Um, you mentioned those acids, and I, I wonder if they are drawing mineral. Are they simply photosynthesizing, or are they also drawing off the substrate they grow on? Um, so, you know, are, do they have needs outside of what they can produce through that photosynthesis that they do? Once again, this is a bit more complex than you might have been waiting for as an answer. I'll start with the simple part. No, lichens do not take anything from their substrate. They provide their own nutrition. However, specifically with crustose lichens and the acids they emit, it does also, because they have to cling on to the rock over time, they do I don't want to say eat per se, but wear off. And as the lichen dies, it sloughs off and, you know, tiny particles of the rock come off with it. So lichens were important in prehistory and actually building soils. So your answer is yes and no. No, they don't take anything from their substrate. But yes, with things like rocks specifically, they do eventually, like over long periods of time, wear them down. Okay. But the, when they're on trees, are there any negative effects on the tree themselves? Absolutely none. No. Wow. And lots of, lots of positive effects because certain oh. animals use them for camouflage. Um, hummingbirds okay. build nests with some lichens. And also, just as I said, because so many of them, not all, but so many, will only live in clean air, specifically, say, usnea. If you've got usnea, you can know every time you look at it, you've got nice clean air. And the cyan cyanobacteria lichens, they're like less, they're rarer, but they also fix nitrogen. So they, that's another sort of, well, just really great thing about them. So, yeah, that's really interesting. It's almost like, um, oh, geez, it's like in Buddhism or something where it's like you do no harm, but you give back a net positive or something like that kind of a concept, you know, because it's neat when an organism has been around long enough to figure out how to do that. Because when I look at, you know, from hunting, for instance, I deal with a lot of different parasites. I run into them and they tend to be sort of hideous to our typical aesthetic. Um, they tend to, uh, you know, have a net negative impact on the organism that they're living inside of. Um, and they look like they would, you know, they kind of creep you out. You get this, like, there's like a repulsion. Um, but when I see lichens, you know, they just are so beautiful and inviting. Uh, it's just interesting that they've evolved to that point where they give back, but they don't necessarily take away. It's fascinating to me. I always assumed they must have some negative impact. I mean, when you see them covering a, you know, the trunk of a tree or something, I just always assumed there'd be some negative. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, how people, lay people should be interacting and shouldn't be interacting with lichens? In particular, I'm thinking about um, we don't have those barrens that you guys have uh, there in Newfoundland here where I live, but if I get up into the subalpine and in particular the alpine regions of the, you know, the Appalachian Mountains here, um, we have, you know, lichens underfoot. And like I said before, there's, you'll often see signs that, you know, admonish you not to step on them and things like that. But I mean, you know, you'll get into these environments where it's almost sometimes you're like, uh oh, like, how do I get out of here without crushing a bunch of these? And I get so worried about that. Um, but also, you know, what about somebody who's into bushcraft or wants to experiment with them? Like, what are some general guidelines for interacting with lichens in a way that doesn't damage um, delicate ecosystems? If you're collecting um, lichens off trees, the arboreal hair lichens and any other lichen that might be growing on a tree, we, we practice what's called salvage botany. Now, this is, again, the hilarity of uh, the difficulty of classing, classifying lichens because right. they're not plants, but yet this is described as salvage botany. But it's collecting branches that have fallen, you know, windfall, basically, and collecting the lichens from those rather than taking the lichen off the living tree. 
that in my area is simple enough because we have a lot of wind storms. So I don't know if you saw Pippi Park when you were here, but I can go into Pippi Park, one of the back entrances, and just pick up a few bags of windfall in a short amount of time. If you're working with crustose lichens or any, you know, even sort of, you know, larger lichens that um, folios or whatnot that would be on a rock, you that's okay. This gets really touchy because it's different for you than it is for me because I'm on the tundra and there are a lot more lichens on the tundra. So I collect lichens in a very conservative fashion, 10% or less of what's in a landscape off rocks that I use as dye lichens. Now, but wait, wait, what does that mean? It, 10, 10% or less what's in, I mean, if I'm in uh, 10,000 acres, I can't take 10% of that. So what do you mean? Um, 10% of what? But, Exactly. Just kind of pick out your, your range, you know, like the number of rocks you're doing or whatever. I mean, that's a rough, rough idea, but a guideline mm-hmm. that got you it. should not have taken more than 10% of what you saw. Okay, got it. And again, even less than that, if you're in a more populated area, if you feel that someone else may have been gathering. And in a lot of parts of the U.S. and Canada that are really populated, there would be maybe you shouldn't gather lichen. They are very slow growing, many of them, not all. Some do grow more quickly, but lots are very slow growing by, um, of course, the jigs and the reels. A lot of the really great dye lichens fall under that category. So if you don't live in a sort of either a an, an area that's not very populated or an area that has a higher than average percentage of its, bio, you know, its biodiversity and life being lichen, you might just want to photograph them, learn about them, and appreciate them like that. If you are in a landscape where there are enough lichen, like Newfoundland, for example, where you can collect a small amount to use for dye craft, or, you know, like I would get Lori some Icelandic moss for her to make some bread or whatever, it's still ultimately just looking at what's at your landscape, what's, what's in your landscape, and collecting or not with a really serious eye to making sure that the population continues. There's a case in Scotland, I was talking earlier about how all the Harris Harris tweeds had been originally lichen dyed, and the quote-unquote lichen mills where those dyes were produced, which was sort of became like a a Scottish, like, let's get rid of rural poverty kind of thing for a while. There was so much lichen harvesting that there are areas of, of the Scottish Highlands where the lichens are just coming back now. Oh, wow. No kidding. So you can denude the landscape and you have to be, you know, right now, as I said, I'm in a lichen wonderland and there are very, very few people who are doing what I'm doing. So as long as I practice basic conservation, I'm pretty good. I've discussed this with science scientists and I've, you know, I feel like I've been well guided on what's appropriate to collect, what isn't, and you know, general guidelines. But you you really need to educate yourself on this, like you would with any foraging. You want to mm-hmm. get a couple of good books. You want to talk to people. But more so than mushrooms or general, you know, herb foraging or whatnot, you really need to know that these are different life, different forms of life. And you're when you're ta- like taking lichens on a, off a rock, you may be taking hundreds of years. Wow! Yeah, of, of life. So you right. do it with the full respect of of that. It's interesting because fungi can grow so rapidly, and they're such a major component of what these composite organisms are. Um, but it's really interesting they grow so slowly. Um, real quickly, I don't want to get us off the track too much here, but what does "by the jigs and reels" mean? Oh, that's a Newfoundland expression. Yeah, um, oh, I can tell. <laughs> um, between this and that, like between all factors combined, okay. I, that's, that's the best, you know, just, just with all things considered <laughs> might be a good way to put it. All things considered, this is this is what you come up with. I want to touch for one second, actually, on lichen as food again. Please, um, yeah. One thing that lichen does have, you know, we were talking about Lori specifically and uh caribou lichen, Cladonia range of farina, lichens are really high in carbohydrates. So that oh, is wow. no kidding. one of the ways that they are a survival food. And some lichens, I'm not sure which ones, although I believe that caribou lichen may have been one of them, during times of economic hardship have been distilled into booze in the Scandinavian countries, I guess. And lichen aquavit has, has been a thing. Um, I, I gather there is a lichen called loberia that 
at some point Siberian monks were making beer out of. So there are some other food and booze usages, but really to just talk about what they would offer as a food, the primary thing is carbohydrates. It's fascinating. I would have thought proteins, but I wouldn't have thought they had many carbohydrates. So that actually brings me to the this question, which is, are all lichens photosynthetic? I see some that are clearly ranging in those like lime greens and those chartreuses and all those colors you're talking about. But I also see some that are, are brown and gray, and I wouldn't associate with being very chlorophyll rich. Um, are they all able to produce energy from sunlight? Oh, yeah. You're not a lichen if you can't photosynthesize. Really? So even like rock tripe, which is all those, you know, just colors I wouldn't associate with photosynthesis. All lichens are different colors when wet and dry. And if you look at a wet rock tripe, it's more of an olive green. Yeah. And you can kind of see yeah. it more then. It's just like, uh, it's the reason I describe it as black frilly stuff is because that's usually what it looks like. But their their colors change. Um, and yeah, they all, you, you've got to be able to photosynthesize to be in the lichen club. Oh, that's interesting. Tell us about some of the art projects that you're doing that kind of merge um, this lichenology with the arts. Um, I guess that, that actually just started through you know, picking up lichen dyeing as a hobby. And then um, this is kind of a funny story, and I don't know if I should say it out loud, but I'm just going to go. Um, <laughs> I had decided that I wanted to um, go to visit Fogo Island. I, In one of my other hats I wear as a writer, I had gotten the opportunity to meet Zeta Cobb, who is in charge of the inn there. And she was fascinating, and I thought she was so cool. And she had kind of made a comment about, oh, you've never been to Fogo. And then I was like thinking to myself, well, if Zeta Cobb thinks I should go to Fogo Island, I should go to Fogo Island. Thing is, how am I going to afford that? Like, that's a very fancy inn. I don't know that there's anywhere else to stay there. So I sort of thought about it, and I thought, I know they do artist residencies. I should apply for one. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't get the artist residency, but it turned out that Zeta Cobb loves lichens. And so the Surefast Foundation, which is the sort of a, a corporate, I don't want to say corporation, an organization that works in partnership with the inn, all the inn, all the money the inn makes goes back to the island. And um, the Surefast Corporation sort of works with environmental projects and whatnot. So I wound up through them and the marketing department getting to go and use one of the artist residences, our artist residence houses for five days and just do a lichen survey which was like oh, cool. the best. It essentially consisted of me ripping around the woods on snowmobiles with various locals, like eating moose stew at cabins and Roy Dwyer, his wife, Christine, for quite a long after, quite a long while afterwards would get in touch over Facebook and say, my little lichens by the cabin were doing fine. <laughs> but that was, um, it was sort of, really amazing that that you know i didn't really expect them to take it even i had just sent it off thinking i'd like to go to that island but when they took me up on it i thought well i'm gonna do a really seriously good job of this so i went to the university and got like every book out about lichens and i guess that was really the point where it was like and so it began so then i wrote a few articles about lichens and that led me into the woman i work with at the university just sort of cold calling me and saying we have a few phd students who've read your article a cbc article i'd written and they want to meet you would you come into the lab so i went in there and you know started work started i guess through the jigs and the reels there sort of you know <laughs> doing a little bit more work in that lab and through that, I guess I just got confident enough that I started, um, I vo- vo- at the time was volunteering at the Native Friendship Center here and was asked to teach a little class on lichen dyeing. So that was the first one. And I taught that workshop and it went really well and people really liked it. So I started teaching more workshops and that led me to get to do some really interesting work through art festivals like the Bonavista Biennale and getting to teach workshops that more focused on the philosophy of the dye making, the process of making the dye and you know, different questions and more intellectual applications rather than just the straight up almost wiki how of like, here's a a dyed Mm -hmm. scarf or whatever. And I wound up meeting an amazing artist named Emily Jan, who was um, doing a residency on the Bonavista Peninsula at the time, but was then going back to the mainland of Canada and doing a show at the Canadian Textile Museum. So kind of a big deal. And she brought one of my lichen dyed pieces and put it in it. 
and oh, that, that cool. was kind of a big thing. Yeah. And as, as things, one thing leads to another, I think after having some of these things behind me, like Fogo Arts, Bonavista Vista Biennale, Textile Museum, I, at a certain point, you're, you're just, you're in the arts. So it's certainly not anything <laughs> that I'm educated in, in or whatever. But yeah. then, uh, yeah, I um, wound up being connected with a woman named Marlene Crete, um, Governor General Award winner, very popular and I don't know, actually let me face it not popular artist very well known and respected artist to say popular kind of demeans Marlene's work because it's very right. intellectual questioning like it's not pop art you have to really go into it and find you know search within it she does incredible work and so she and the the, the woman that I was working with in the lab wanted to meet her and I thought well She's done a lot of favors for me. This is the first thing she's ever asked for me from me is she wants to meet Marlene. I'll introduce them. So they hit it off and I came up with an idea. I referenced this earlier in the interview that we would do. It, at first, it was just going to be a little story, an article for the Newfoundland Quarterly or something about a conversation between Yolanda, the landscape ecologist who studies lichen, and Marlene, the artist who works a lot with lichen, and how their two different perspectives really complemented and enriched each other. And we get into sort of artsy language here, but like created uh, like almost a symphony of understanding that came mm -hmm. together. The idea that, you know, art and a larger idea that art and science can create an understanding that's more than the sum of its parts. And so that just became so interesting that at this point we found a publisher and with any luck, as long as quarantine and COVID doesn't get in the way of this, by 2021, we should have a manuscript. But more people got involved. Um, now we're thinking about trying to, you know, push it into possibly a new MFA program at a university here, which would, you know, would sort of, the, the, the idea in being integrating the arts and life sciences in the same idea, in, you know, with under the same under the, under the same umbrella of those two disciplines complementing an understanding of the world rather than being at odds with each other. Yeah, so that's, be nice. become, <laughs> that's become a pretty large project. And um, a poet, Don Mackay, some, a lot of different people have gotten involved in that. But so that, that's the, 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 that's a long and convoluted answer, but that's sort of how I wound up in the arts with Lycan was getting into both studying the craft applications, but also the chemistry and the actual biology of the lichen, and, and finding that the real interest in that came from both the scientific community and the arts community, and realizing that gave me an opportunity to have some fun with that and sort of say, because it's a little passion of mine anyway, and say, let's put these two disciplines together. So it, it was such a dream to see Marlene and Yolanda meet and really just be you know, start to talk about this is how when I look at a lichen in my scientific sense, bringing art and imagery in it can help my understanding. And, you know, Marlene saying, and yes, for me as an artist, like this is how understanding more about the lichen can inform the work that I do around it. I mean, it's fascinating from your perspective too, just following your passion where all this keeps leading you into, you know, deeper and deeper realms with it too. So it's, it's really interesting to hear about all that. Is there, for, for those of us who are like, um, lay people, citizen ecologists, you know, are there books you'd recommend? Where, where do we learn more about lichens if we want to go a little bit deeper? Um, if you're interested in lichen dying, there's a small book called um, Lichen Dies, the new source book by Karen Diadek Castleman. That's like the classic. That's that's okay. the one to get. There are a few older books as well, which are also good. But um, because the really the conservation element of lichen dye has really developed in the past 20 years, you you have to keep in mind when you're working with older books that some methods they will talk about for lichen collection are not things we do anymore because we've <laughs> discovered they're not really that responsible. So that's, I totally recommend that book. The book I keep talking about, Lichens of North America, we, um, we in the field call it Brodo's book, but that's really, I have, you know, talking about it publicly, there's also the Sharnoffs. Su Sylvia and Stephen were also part of it, but Erwin Brodo was the lichenologist at the Museum of Nature before um, he retired and Troy McMullen took his position. So Brodo, you know, Brodo's book is the Bible and Troy is the new Brodo. 
And Troy has also written a book about lichens of North America. Troy works a lot in Maine and teaches some great cr- courses there, one on keying out crustose lichens. So you, you should look up Troy McMullen. He's, if you want to know more about lichens, he, as I said, has written a really good book on the lichens of, of the East Coast of North America. So it would be great for a person in Maine or around there, lichens that are specific to you. And um, also just he's done some great, you know, videos and interviews. And if you read some of his stories, you'll also come across some, the lichenologist, the the landscape ecologist who studies lichen that I work with, Yolanda, she works with him as well. So you'll come across her work there too. In terms of other books, um, I know that there would be more out there, but in all honesty, that's the three that I work with as as a dye book, as a general reference book, and then as a a more specific reference book for the East Coast Troy's book. You you know, when, when it, when I look back on um, the world of mushrooms and, you know, fungi mycology has been thrust into the mainstream in the last decade in a really interesting way. So something that was pretty obscure for a while and had been kind of largely forgotten about by most people has be, has had a resurgence. And so it's it's collecting for food is, is a big part of it, you know, restaurant culture and things like that. But also, you know, mycopharmacology, you know, has become very popular. So there's been a, a lot of, you know, people looking at the world of mushrooms from a from a pharmacological perspective um, and just in our art and in our mindset. Now there's some unique things about fungi that I think have led to that. But I, my question is, do you anticipate or are you seeing that lichens are going to get kind of any spotlight like that? Are they going to come into mainstream culture in any kind of way? Or do you think that they'll always sort of be on the fringe biologically and that, uh, you know, you almost have to look in order to, to really find much about them? I don't think they're ever going to hit deep mainstream culture. Like you're never going to see anything about lichens on entertainment tonight or that sort of thing. (laughs) But um, in terms of like just university culture, arts culture, they really are becoming more like certain ideas that we study in terms of moving past like social Darwinism and getting more into the idea of a cooperative civilization, people begin to use lichens and as, as an analogy because they are a symbiosis and two organisms that don't, you know, in, cannot live in some environment separately, but can live can live together. So they're being used almost more in ways as a political metaphor. Then again, because of their, their possible antibiotic use that, um, that, ha- you know, they have more currency and more mainstream sciences now. Uh, Can you go I, back I think- a little bit to what you were just saying about that, that piece about social Darwinism and um, kind of the symbiosis of lichens. I, I get what you're saying, but I, I almost want it. I feel like um, we shouldn't breeze over that. Can you flesh that out a little bit? Um, have you heard of the book, The Mushroom at the End of the World? No, I have not. Okay, I, I won't use that as a reference then, but it's it's a, a book that, that is really popular. Um, and there's there are a lot of books now that are, are using using fungi i guess actually as political metaphors okay. but um this uh the idea with like we tend to look at nature as tooth and claw competition survival mm-hmm. of the fittest i'm certainly not saying everyone does but that is a sort of an idea we've been given but there and then within human society that boils down to social darwinism and it often has some pretty ugly repercussions where people can sort of look at those who aren't doing very well and like well it's survival of the fittest or whatnot and as this, i believe as a society we are attempting to move past that and uh, what has become a metaphor in some you know certain feminist um you know what's the word i guess intellectual circles for lack of a better way to describe it and in you know different political science field um fields is the idea of the lichen as because it is a symbi a symbiosis and two organisms that help each other survive rather than compete that that's just simply a metaphor in nature that shows that competition is not always the key to success. Working together can often be the key to success, to success, and that when you work together, you can often survive in environments that you wouldn't be able to survive in if you couldn't work together. That's really nice. I think like we need because I, I, when I look at at the tooth and claw part, it's not like you can't find examples of that. It's kind of all around us. It is there, but it's not the only story taking place. And so it seems like we've sort of elevated that to in, 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 in such a way that it's so out of balance with what we actually see 
in that greater community of life, right? There's just so much cooperation. There's so much symbiosis. And, and this kind of idea of two and even, you said even three organisms sometimes. Um, His lichens are that. genderless and polyamorous. So they are definitely, <laughs> they are leading us into the future with their freak flag flying. Oh like my goodness, uh, right? Just yeah, waving that chartreuse flag. <laughs> wacky little beings. But yeah, I think that that's really important right now because the, these metaphors are actually really important to our understanding of the world. Yeah, and then shape you say our worldview. Yeah, certainly true that there is, you know, tooth and claw competition is a part of nature. But to see it as the only way that it works, I mean, there's a lot of studies being done now with, uh, speaking of kingdom fungi in larger ways, the mycelial connections between trees and how mm -hmm. older trees, before they die, give their nutrients to younger trees and just ways that the forest cooperates to keep itself healthy. Right. So it's it's so much of a larger story than just me megafauna hunting it, each other. <laughs> right, right. That's such an ultra simplistic worldview uh well i appreciate we yeah we do i i'm appreciating this territory you're going into i'm wondering if there's any if we really zoom out you know to fifty thousand feet a hundred thousand feet any big picture messages you'd like to pass on to this audience as it relates to lichen or life or or just philosophically in general um because it seems like wow i it seems like these lichen are um I don't know what would be the word. If we were talking about mushrooms, I'd be like, I feel like they've myceliated your mind, but I don't know what the word with lichen would be, but I feel like they're, you know, you're almost speaking on a platform of lichen right now. So, you know, what, what's the big message that I guess you or lichen or the, or you guys symbiotically have to share with us? Well, I often compare lichen to the Lorax in that they speak for the trees. Like you can tell so much about an ecosystem's health. And the more you know about what lichens grow where, like how much water is there, where that water is to be found. Like there's so, you can read a landscape in a lot of ways with what's going on with the lichen. And that's kind of, as I was saying, in terms of like the fact that in many biomes, you don't even want to harvest any lichen because there might not be that much of it, or you may be in a heavily, heavily populated area, and all you would even want to do is look at it, photograph it, learn more about it. It's still worthwhile learning about lichen dying and different uses of lichen, A, because it just gives you more of an appreciation for nature, but also through these sorts of things, they're I think anyone who knows their stuff, if they're teaching this kind of stuff, is teaching it as a actually a way to sort of teach conversation, teach conservation through a craft. Because I can't talk to you about lichen dye without talking to you about mm -hmm. why you can't gather too much lichen and the role of lichen in the in the in the ecosystem and about salvage botany and about all sorts of topics of conservation, about how amazing lichen are, about what they do, that I hopefully will give you more appreciation for the landscape. A fun thing that some museums do with kids' workshops is they will, like moths tend to hide in lichens on trees, so you often, the pa the patterns of the moths will match the lichens. So there's, I've, I have not like been at one of these workshops, but I gather they exist, where kids are taught about the moths and the lichens as, you know, just sort of a lens to look at what's happening in that ecosystem system, but then they will dye a little cape for themselves called a moth cloth with the lichens to match the moth. The kids get to go home with the moth cloth. So you can't That's go cool. wrong with anything that gives a kid a cape. Right. But you also, you're not really like, it's not your normal, say, natural dye workshop where you're like, we're going to dye a t-shirt and this is how. It's like, we're going to explore what lichens are, what they do, the amazing chemicals they can contain and their amazing applications through either dying with them or sometimes I do workshops with Lori where she'll talk about their f food value first and have a bread or whatnot and then I'll talk about dye and medicine but it's all we're generally not encouraging people to go out and forage or if they do to do it very conservatively we just really want to teach them about lichens and how amazing they are and i think it it enriches your entire world to know about the incredible biodiversity in all these tiny little things that are all around you all year long you make the topic very thrilling which i think 
for a lot of people is probably unexpected. You don't ex maybe anticipate likens to be a thrilling topic. So I just want to say well done and I appreciate it. And I hope that we can uh, talk again in the future because I know there's a lot of other topics that you, I mean, I, this morning was reading articles, you know, from you on the seal hunt and reading about uh, entomophagy and things like that. So I know you've got a, a wide range of topics you're into, but I just want to say thank you for, for making this topic so really exciting. And um, I feel like my eyes are going to be much more open to this aspect of our landscape now. Um, and the deep, I guess the deep antiquity of these symbiotic relationships, you know, that really fascinates me. So Felicity, thanks so much for today. Oh, thanks for having me. As you can tell, I, I am really passionate about these guys. And it's a lot like Lori when you get her on traditional food. It's why we're such good friends is we are total geeks. Like <laughs> we, we don't really have lives outside this. We just hang right. out with each other and do things with natural things. But it is so fun to get to talk to someone who wants to hear me go on about why I love lichens. So thank you so much for having me. Um, where else, you know, where do you like people to connect with you online, social media, anything like that? Um, I don't really have what you would call a professional Instagram like Lori does. So I just basically, um, you know, I, I have a lot of work that I did on the Overcast. So that's, you know, that particular web page has a lot of my lichen articles. There's a CBC lichen article I wrote for CBC Newfoundland that's kind of, that's probably my best piece in all honesty. I'm also a tour guide for Atlas Obscura. So you can find my, I mean, obviously we, we hope they're going to go ahead this year. Luckily, I, I planned them for late in the year. The first one is at the very end of August. But that's, um, that is, if anyone was actually interested in new, coming to Newfoundland and going on a tour I did, which would also include Lori, you can do that through Atlas Obscura. That, that would be my professional, you know, representation is Felicity Roberts as Atlas Obscura tour guide. Perfect. We'll put links to all that. Hey, one last question for you. Something I like to uh, ask guests that come on. And um, we've touched, you know, we kind of dance around it a little bit. I think it always comes up when you have any kind of ecological conversation or conversations about how human beings are relating to wild environments. Um, but the question is, when you look to the future uh, and you look at the relationship that human beings have to the natural world and... Um, how our civilization has, you know, expanded around the globe and whatnot. Do you look forward and, and anticipate a time where human beings achieve a kind of living equilibrium with the wild world? Or do you see us kind of consuming the world into um, a deepening extinction event, you know, maybe one that even includes us? Like, do you think that we figure this thing out? Because we are at this perilous moment where so we're learning so much about ecology so quickly. Um, and the new generations are raised with, you know, new ideas about how to relate to the landscape. Um, but we've also uh, kind of we're waking up to it at such a late stage. So are you optimistic? Or are you pessimistic about the human relationship to the natural world in the future? I think that's a choice we have to make. I think I don't I don't think the future is written. I think we get to write it. Choose wisely. <laughs> well said, Felicity. Awesome talking to you today. Thanks so much. Awesome talking to you too. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.